It's time to talk markets, and we're chatting right now with Brian Voth of IntelliFarm. Brian, great to chat with you. Hey, thanks, Sean. Always a pleasure to be on here. Yeah, it's great to uh, to have this chat with you. So, a, a bit of a head scratcher, I, I, in some respects. Uh, maybe uh, also some frustration mixed in there. Why does it feel like? this market's really being pumped to the downside right now. What exactly is going on? Well, I guess first off, when you've had a couple of years of just super abnormally high values, anything coming off of that is going to feel like, you know, you're getting kicked when you're down kind of thing. And especially when it's just, it's been like a long, slow decline, you know, off of the 2022, 2021 highs, I guess, early 2022 highs. Um, not, you know, and it shouldn't be a real surprise. It was fueled a lot by COVID, supply chain issues, drought, production issues, uh, demand. And it just all led to some tightened balance sheet situations. You know, were the prices justified at the ultimate highs? Maybe not. You know, it, it's very easily could have been overdone. But you got to remember, high prices, the reason for high prices is to encourage production and discourage demand and you know get buyers to look at alternative products or something like that because that balance sheet needs to be rebuilt back up from a production standpoint and so we've done that you know going from 2021 into 2022 and we're still you know despite the fact yes we're well off the highs you got to look historically we're still way above any kind of historical average or normal value but it's very easy to get used to those high values. And that I think is the biggest, biggest thing that farmers and even, you know, even us as advisors that we struggle with is because those high prices are really nice. And it's easy to, to market in that environment. It's a lot harder to market now when we're coming down off of those highs and you know, every day or every other day you're slightly lower than the day before and it's like, oh, well, I'm just gonna wait until prices come back. And a lot of people are still waiting. Yeah, it was really easy <laughs> to market when the mar- you know to to market your crop you know when, when it's a basically just put it in the bin and hold it and that's the marketing strategy because the market's just higher the next day and the day after and the day after that we're in a little bit of a different situation here now is this all structured around demand because we for the most part you know at least from a North American standpoint crops not even in. So this isn't really supply around supply at this point. Is this just all funneling around the fact that there's concern about demand for agricultural commodities in the back half of 23 then? It's, I guess that's a little bit twofold because, you know, some of the supply numbers are already set when you're looking, when you think about a global balance sheet anyways, you know, South American harvest is more or less it's wrapped up and, Yeah, Argentina production took a real kicking because of drought, but Brazil's production was way up. So when you look at South America as a whole, yeah, it's still a record crop. And their values are substantially lower than North American values. And the biggest buyers, obviously Chinese, are not jumping all over buying cheap South American beans. Actually, the price difference is so big that there's actually been ships of South American beans landing in southern U.S. into the Gulf already. And that is a really bizarre situation. It, it has happened before, but it's rare. But that just shows you how big of a price disparity there is on something like soybeans. When you look at something like wheat and Russia's big crop that they have, and their wheat values are way lower than North American values, yeah, our wheat balance sheet in Canada and in the U.S. is the tightest it's been in about eight or nine years, something like that. But our values are still way too high to be getting export demand overseas. And so either you know Brazilian prices, Russian values need to come up, or our North American values still need to go down further to make us more competitive on a global scale. And that's the part that nobody wants to admit that or realize that, that we are still way overpriced despite the fact that we've come off the highs but in reality we're still just not that competitive on on a global scale so it is a bit of twofold a demand side and a supply side along with especially in the last two three months the funds have absolutely cleaned house you know they've gone from 
long and in some cases record long positions to now holding massive short positions. So, you know, they've taken their money and they've run. Yeah. And, and before people complain about that, and I, I know why I would understand why you would complain about it, but let's just throw this in here. We enjoy the funds being on the long <laughs> side, pushing it to the upside, you know, and some many times pushing it past where the fundamentals would indicate the prices should be. Absolutely. Is, is on the, it works the other way too. And, <laughs> and that's right now a lot of attention uh, in terms of the shorts in the wheat market and how they have really, really punished that, 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 that wheat market at this point. Yeah, absolutely. And that's the thing. Like if you look at, I track the, the fund positions week over week. And as of last week, they were short 114,000 contracts just in Chicago alone. And I'd have to look back at what they were, but you know, two, three months ago, they were probably long somewhere in the 40, 50,000 contract range. So that's a huge turnaround. And similar, you know, they had been long about 70, 75,000 contracts in Canola. And as of last week, they're now short 52,000. So same thing, like it's a huge turnaround and you're, and you're bang on. Yeah, we love them when they're buying and pushing things up. And it's pushing Canola to 25, 28 bucks, or it's pushing wheat to, you know, 14, 15, 16 bucks. But if the equilibrium price should be, you know, on canola, let's just say maybe the equilibrium price should be 750, they pushed it to 1200. And if they push it down to 600, it's now taken the flip flop side. And it just, it, what it does is it basically expands the range of where the commodity would trade normally. And that's been the case for, you know, 10, 15 years already that they just, they take it to the extremes. So it's great for us on the way up but it's really hard to watch on the way back down again. Yeah, and relatively speaking, you, you look at November canola at 682 at the time we were doing this discussion. Lots of times where we talked about how the heck of canola ever get over 500 again. So <laughs> relatively speaking, we're, we're in a, you know, a decent position. We are just off of those highs from, from, from where we were, hey, say, a, a year ago. It, now, correct me if I'm wrong but is this typically here in early may is this typically where we see a market kind of act like this or is this unique uh it's it's dragging out a little bit normally aside from the last couple of years but normally markets would tend to peak out somewhere in late january early february basically as south american harvest ramps up and would drop off typically into, you know, towards end of March, end of April, somewhere in there, and then see a rally back up into middle of June, roughly speaking, uh, as we see what the North American harvest, or sorry, North American planting progress looks like, what the crop conditions are doing, et cetera, et cetera. If there's any kind of adverse weather, sometimes that rally can take us into July, but most often it's middle of June, and then you start to turn back around and drop off through the summer months until harvest is, you know, 50%, 70% done, and we get a better idea of what the crop looks like. That's the very seasonal patterns, which obviously have not been at play in the last couple of years. But I do wonder if that's starting to be a factor again now. And just the fact that the funds have ramped up such a short position. If there is anything inclement about North American seeding this year, if the funds decide to come in and short cover, we could have a very quick, very fast rally to the upside. It's like that now, elastic band, right? Exactly. Like, like Yep. But just remember, on a move like that, highly unlikely that's the start of another bull market. That is a bounce that needs to be taken advantage of and sold. It's an opportunity. Exactly. And nobody's going to want to hear this next sentence, but... If there's not major issues, I still think we're taking another leg down by the end of the year. Okay, so when you say leg, give me a context <laughs> of that because I I understand what you're saying, but um, is is that more of the same here or like what do you mean by a leg? Kind of define that for us. Put, give us some context to it. Well, I guess it depends. Are we talking like a Kara leg or a Brian leg? Because one of those is a lot longer than the other one. But this is quite true. Uh, <laughs> Um, no, I think 
if there's not major issues and we pull off, you know, a, a normal crop, a yield this year, these prices are still too high from where we need to be longer term. So by the end of the year, if we pull off an average yield, we could be looking more at like 650 canola. We could be looking at, you know, $7 wheat futures. I'm talking seven to $8 wheat. We could be looking more like $12 soybeans kind of thing. Like this to me is still not the new normal value. Yeah. And I, I guess, and is that all based on the fact that what is that based on? Is that just when you say we're overpriced relative to where we should be? That that's obviously a fundamental. That's not you're not doing a technical evaluation according to the charts. You're talking about the fundamentals of uh, supply and demand. Is, is that recessionary concerns? Uh, it's a little bit both technical and fundamental. In that, a I don't think we've seen the full effects of what these high prices have done because again we're. The demand is still not up to where the balance sheets currently have them penciled in. And so I just I think those high values had a way bigger impact on demand than what we realized. It's just that's always a lagged thing to come into the market. And so if if the demand continues to be lackluster, there's still we're still building a balance sheet up and prices need to get to a point where it actually starts to encourage buying again. That's the thing about prices. It's really easy to destroy demand. It takes a lot longer to get demand back. And yeah. that's why that's why you see in these markets, you see that big spike up and then you see a drop off and a long sideways or long tail to this market because it is now trying to get demand back and uh, and start reducing the ending stocks, like building up production or sorry, building up demand discouraging production possibly depending on where we get to but this this is why markets just do this all over and over you know high prices cure high prices low prices cure low prices because low prices will encourage demand and discourage production well and that's why everything in ag is cyclical right absolutely and what i will say though is that you know we haven't done the may intake yet for canadian farmer sentiment index uh, but what we did see in in March was farmers kind of having a real bearish tone or an outlook on which direction we're going when it comes to commodity crops. Like if, if you look, um, I'm going to put it on the screen here. You might not be able to see it, Brian, but you know, going back to September, a hundred is neutral. Okay, one the, the, in September of 22, it was a 128 in terms of outlook on 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 the direction of the markets. Ve farmers feeling very bullish. A lot of attitude around. We're going back to the spring 22 highs. Clearly that hasn't happened. But if you look at now and, and basically each month, it's kind of gone downwards. We're looking right now at a 74. So farmers overall feeling somewhat the same as what you're talking about here. Pretty negative tone to the direction of uh, the commodity markets. As of March, when we did the survey, the question is, do people risk manage? Did they, did they do things about that bearish tone that they had and the concern they had? I wonder if the risk management strategy followed through. Time will tell on that one. Well, and that's it's been tough because, you know, when you look at where, again, where prices have been the last couple of years, it was really easy to get used to. And, you know, when we were talking about forward pricing canola for this fall, 2023, and, you know, we're looking at, you know, $18, $19 canola. It was kind of funny, I guess, in a way, when we're getting pushback from clients, but well, why would I forward price $18 or $19 canola? Like, I'm just going to wait for $22. And, I, and my, my only response to comments like that is, how much, how much bin space do you have and how many years are you willing to wait? Because ultimately, yeah, you might be right at some point, but you might have to be sitting on something for a long time before we see those values ever again. And it even, even go back a little bit further. And it was like having a debate over, well, sh should we sell $25 canola? And I'm like, do you know how dumb this question is right now? How dumb this sounds that we're actually having a discussion about this, but that's the reality. And that, again, that was so easy to get used to that when you start looking at, Oh, $18 canola, like what, what is this, a peasant oil seed now? Like I got to sell $18 canola? And this is where to me for 2023, having your cost of production and your budget figured out early was the ultimate key. 
because when we were looking at, say, last summer, for example, uh, a lot of farms would typically buy their fertilizer for the following year. So last yeah. summer, guys were buying fertilizer for this spring, and it was ridiculously high price fertilizer. You know, we're talking 800 bucks, 900 bucks, 1000 bucks a ton. And I said, that's fine. I said, we can work around that because at that point, you could still forward price, you know, $20 canola for this year, 21, whatever it was. I said, but do not just buy that fertilizer and do nothing on the marketing side. Like that is a recipe for disaster. Um, I said, if you're not willing to forward price, then don't buy the fertilizer because I was also bearish on fertilizer values mainly because I was bearish on grain prices and fertilizer tends to follow those. So I said, I think that fertilizer is coming down. I said, I actually, I think your best strategy is to forward price the grain and not buy the fertilizer. But there is some risk in that one too, because with all of the issues with Russia and whatnot, it was like, okay, but are we actually, if we don't buy it now, are we actually going to physically get it by the spring of 2023 or not? So there was a different concern there as well, but the underlying thought was fine. Buy the fertilizer, secure your needs, but also go and forward price a bunch of grain. You're buying high price fertilizer, offset it with high priced grain. Mm. And the strategy worked out really well. Obviously, now it looks like we should have sold a whole lot more than what we did, but it's also hard to think about selling, you know, fall of 2023 grain when you haven't even combined fall of 2022 grain yet. Yeah, absolutely. To be fair, you're 100% correct. Now, Okay, we, we have established the scenario, and I know this is a scenario that you believe in, the scenario of where the market works, you know, whatever sort of, I'm not sure what velocity, but it's working its way to the downside because we potentially are overpriced. Give me the bullish case. G give me the case that this is temporary and um, we, we, we could see the market be higher from these levels going forward. So, so I got to put on the farmer hat now. Yeah. Well, maybe like what, what is the scenario? Because there's, there's two sides to, to any sort of trade, right? So when, when, when somebody is uh, buying those puts, somebody's selling them. So what's the, what's the reality here for people that are looking at the upside? So, I mean, upside is, is that okay, balance sheets currently are still on the tight side, both, Canada, US, um, globally, depending on which one, how you want to look at it, but balance sheets are still tight. So there's some underlying support to that until we get you know, new crop production in, in North America, for example. And that is a big question mark because obviously right now, lots of progress in the Southern states with planting. Northern states are not doing a whole lot yet because it's still cold, it's still wet, there's still snow on the ground in some places. Similar story to Canada, or at least Manitoba and maybe eastern Saskatchewan. So there's there's concerns over, you know, is there going to be a delay in seeding? You know, down in your neck of the woods, it's still, I believe, rather on the dry side. It is. And, you know, guys have been seeding for a couple of weeks already, I think. But so there's, there's, there's weather concerns that way as to what is that going to do to yield and production? And that is a big question mark. And it's a very valid one. Um, but right now... Nobody's going to plan off of a disaster and nobody's going to plan off of a record number. So you kind of have to go off of average. And, you know, then there's the whole acreage debate. And I would say I, I, I would value or trust the USDA numbers a little bit more than Stats Canada, considering why on earth Stats Canada decided to pull acres in December is beyond me. And it's beyond dumb and useless because from December 15th to January 15th, nobody had a final crop plan in mind yet. So the Stats Canada numbers that came out last week were basically garbage, I would say. And uh, so there's this debate over, you know, the corn and the soybean acres in the U.S. There's the winter wheat situation in the U.S., which is, I mean, for lack of a better word, it's abysmal looking, right? So there's that. That's an underlying supportive factor. The delays in the northern plains, also a bullish factor on the wheat side, along with the whole Black Sea area. So all these things should be theoretically providing some support to things. And then I saw a headline this morning that Ukraine tried to attack the Kremlin with drones. Yeah. Like I, there's, there's a little bit of geopolitical uncertainty to things as well, obviously. Um, yeah. So I just, there are, there are bullish or supportive factors right now. 
they have taken a back seat to fund liquidation though. Yeah, right. I, and I was taught a long time ago, you know, a couple of weeks ago, we did a market interview where we talked about how the condition, the poor, a bit, you use the abysmal, good description, the abysmal condition of the winter wheat crop, Oklahoma, Kansas, and parts of Nebraska. And was that uh, sort of a, maybe a, an, an enabler for some positivity to happen in the spring wheat market? Uh, since then, we were asking those questions and talking about it. It feels like the spring wheat market's just been kind of hammered to the downside. So obviously, the, that is not exactly taking hold. You, you never want, I was taught a long time ago, you never want wheat to lead the market higher. You want corn. Okay, so uh, when I look at this, it's like, okay, we we have an underplanting of corn, which is still possible based on 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 weather potentially, and we don't hit the trend yield. That is is that that's really kind of what we're I, I guess if you're on the long side and most farmers are, it's what you're hoping for at this point, right? That's what you gotta hang your head on if you're hoping that prices take another leg higher. And that's again, it's a legitimate thought and it's a legitimate concern because of the time frame that we are in right now and when you look at some of the longer term weather forecasts like it's it, it, if it turns into be a hotter and drier summer all the way down through the midwest absolutely we may we may really struggle to hit trend line or average yields but there's also the thought that there's an extra three and a half million acres of corn going in the ground this year versus last year so Along with the fact that demand has just been lackluster. So again, it's yes, there are, there's always going to be bullish factors. There's always going to be bearish factors. And a lot of these things are just things that play out over time as we get further and further into the crop year, but hanging your hat on, you know, the few bullish things that you can find and doing nothing from a marketing or strategy perspective, it's a, that's a risky game to play in my mind. Hey, Brian, this has been a great discussion. Always fun to chat with you. I, I think what we've learned here is have a risk management plan, have a marketing strategy, follow up with, you know, wrap, wrap that in some discipline and uh, good luck to everybody. Uh, those are some, uh, some rough waters out there. I think we're going to, this can be a bit of an interesting 2023. No doubt. Yep. And as long as guys get out into the field here uh, before the first week of June, I'm going to be happy because that's kind of where last year started at. So anything before that, and I think we're, we're in good shape, at least for the starting point. Exactly. Hey, Brian, thanks so much. I really appreciate it. Thanks, Sean. Always a pleasure. That is Brian Voth with Intellifarm. Make sure you check him out online. Great market advisory service does uh, fantastic work. Always enjoy our chats. Hey, encourage everybody to check out the Real Agriculture YouTube channel. Lots on there from agronomics to markets to machinery. And uh, make sure you hit that subscribe button as well. Thanks, everybody. Cheers.